Hey there, uh, Pastor Robert here, one of the pastors at Magnolia Cowboy Church, and I'm so thankful that you joined our live stream broadcast. And our desire and our prayer uh, would be that you would be ministered to today through the worship, through the prayer, through the message by the Lord himself. Um, we come here uh, each, each day expectant to hear God's voice. And that's really why we go to church and why we spend the time and energy is, like he said, come follow me, that we would hear his voice uh, very clearly each and every day. It says, my sheep know my voice. And as his sheep, we want to hear from the master. We want to hear from our savior, Jesus. And today, uh, whatever you have going on in your life, whether it be emotional, physical, uh, spiritual, that you would be ministered to by the Lord himself, by the Holy Spirit uh, that would move and you'd feel his presence and experience God in a brand new way. And your prayers would be answered. And maybe it's healing that you need. Uh, whatever it is, uh, be expectant uh, today that God would move on your behalf. He's for you. He's not against you. Now enjoy the message. Uh, we're in a series of messages called God in Us, and it is, we're going through the book of Acts. Last week, we looked at uh, what real saving faith was and how we found that, that uh, the Ethiopian eunuch possessed real saving faith, and it changed his life. And now we are going to look at the life of one of the most transformed people in the entire New Testament. Now, there, there are others for sure, the Gadarene demoniac and, and the woman at the well and so many others that had their lives transformed or the lepers that were, that were healed. But this guy, this guy, not only was his life transformed, but he went on to transform what is probably now in the billions of lives because of his writing and his teaching. And we know him up to this point in the Bible as Saul, the Pharisee, the persecutor of the church. He was there in chapter 7, verse 58, when they decided they were going to stone Stephen. And they laid their garments at Paul's feet to watch, and he gave his consent as a voting member of the Sanhedrin. And his entire life now has been dedicated to annihilating anybody that would mention the name of Jesus and totally putting to an end this brand new church. And I originally titled this A Transformed Life, but after reading it and thinking about it, I should have called it A Funny Thing Happened to Me on the Way to Hell, I Got Saved, right? Because here's the Apostle Paul. He is literally hell-bent for leather trying to wipe out anything about Jesus. He is the ultimate, the ultimate persecutor of the church. He hates Christ and everything that he stands for. But this moment was so powerful in his life that he recounts for us. Luke writes it out in chapter number nine as an historian. Paul gives his own testimony in chapter 22 and chapter 26, adding some other detail. And all throughout his preaching in the gospel, he'll refer to this moment in his life. And even in the epistles that, that he writes and the letters that we have that he has written to the church, he always somehow in each one of those the epistles, the majority of the time, he has a reference back to this life-changing moment. And he becomes, from this moment on, he'll become a central character in the life of the church. This guy is, has been totally turned around. Born a Jew. He's a Pharisee. In fact, he says in Philippians, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I was a top echelon. I was, he was educated in Greek philosophy and thought. Uh, he was, by grace, became a believer. He was a missionary, a theologian, evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, a preacher, an organizer, a leader, a great thinker, a statesman, a spiritual father, a fighter, and a lover all at the same time. He wrote 13 of the 27 books that we have in the New Testament. Without this guy giving his life to Christ, we would know nothing of what it means to be in Christ because Paul wrote about all of those things. And we're going to look at a couple of them toward the end of our message. In fact, there are over 30 
transactions that happen in the life of a believer and transformation, the moment that you give your life to Christ that Paul elucidates and teaches us about because of his experience that he's going to have here on the road to Damascus. Paul was a, 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 a disciple of Gamaliel who is one of the top Pharisees, had one of the top schools, and he would memorize long portions of scripture. And he knew the Old Testament. He, knew, he knows it so well that when you study his writings, those other 13 books that he wrote in the New Testament, he quotes the Old Testament 180 times or at least makes allusion to them. And some, people, some scholars believe well over 200 times. So what we knew as Jesus being prophesied in the Old Testament, this guy who hated Jesus, who hated the church, who who is breathing murders, who persecuted, put people in prison, divided up families, was feared and hated all at the same time. He becomes the one that teaches us what the Old Testament prophesied we now have in the flesh before us in the Lord Jesus Christ. So why do I say that? Number one, no matter how bad you think you are, you weren't as bad as this guy was. And no matter how much you think you've done that God can't love you, you've not been as guilty as this guy has been guilty. And so we open up chapter number nine with these verses. Verse one and two, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters for him to the synagogues of Damascus so that he, if he found anywhere who, who were of the way, you remember what Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. Exactly. He's the way. And this was, this was a derogative way of, respond, of referring to Christians. Yeah, the way. You know, that Jesus who had the way. He said, I want to get letters so that I can do away with these people. And he, he, he says, uh, whether there are men or women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So Paul, who is responsible for the death of Stephen, is now breathing out, breathing rather, murderous threats. That means literally he lived for one thing and that was to persecute Christians. You remember that song back in the 70s that says, all I need is the air that I breathe and to love you. Here's Paul. All I need is the air that I breathe and to kill you. He is doing nothing but 24 seven thinking about how am I going to hurt these people? In Acts 26, part of his testimony, I'll read it to you. He said, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only shut up many of the saints in prison by authority of the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my votes against them. I punished them often in all the synagogues. I tried to make them blaspheme and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. You get the point that God doesn't like Christians. You got somebody like that in your life that's just doing everything they can to trip you up. Everything they can to expose you to be a fraud because they think that God's not real. Everything they can to mock you or maybe you are that person that does that. And the only reason you're here right now is to get somebody off your back or finally prove to them I told you that was a bunch of baloney or worse. Paul is in great darkness and bondage. Now here's a guy who knew the word of God. He didn't have to go and study the Bible. He studied the Bible all of his life, all the Old Testament, because there was no new, there was no new Testament yet. There will be when Paul is done. But prior to this, there's not. So all he has is the Old Testament. And through the Old Testament, he believed in his darkened mind that Jesus is the problem, that he is not the Messiah. So I want to tell you what a Bible professor of mine said Years ago, in fact, it was the president of our Bible college. He said, gentlemen, and the two or three girls that also were at that school, of which I was smart enough to get the smartest and the prettiest one to get to marry me. He said, gentlemen and ladies, you can be theologically straight as a gun barrel and just as empty spiritually. And so some of you have been raised in church. Some of you know the Bible. I can start a verse and you can finish it, but you don't know God. Your life has never been transformed. You have never met the living Lord Jesus Christ because if you had, your life would be different than it is right now. And you wouldn't be so angry and you wouldn't be so bitter and you wouldn't be so caustic of the things of the truth. Paul is in darkness. 
Why is he in darkness? Well, listen to what Jesus said about the darkness that we live in. Jesus is the light of the world. He's talking to a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus wants to know, what is it? What, how, is it how, do I, how am I born again? And, and, and Nicodemus came to him at night when it was dark. And here's what Jesus says to Nicodemus. This is the judgment that light is coming to the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. The bottom line is Paul didn't come to the light because he's an evil man. There is murder and threatenings and anger and bitterness, all because he believed that Jesus was not the Son of God and he needed to be eliminated and his followers. Whoever does, not, whoever, whoever does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed, but he who practices the truth comes to the light so his deeds may be manifested as having wrought in God. So how do we put this in modern day terminology where we see the transformation of this guy. This would be like a radicalized imam of the Islamic faith that hates the great Satan America and the God that the Americans represent and carries out terrorist threats and terrorist plots and in, in, encourages and equips people to do the same. One day on the way to hell, he gets saved and turn around and he becomes an evangelist on the par of Billy Graham. That's the Apostle Paul. That's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was in great darkness and bondage until he comes in contact with the Lord. Verse number three. And he journeyed and he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone about him from heaven. Acts 22 and 26, as Paul given his testimony, he said it was noon. And this is, in, this, this is in the Middle East. Noon in the Middle East with no clouds. A pretty hot, bright day, right? And he said, but there was something brighter than that. And that was the Lord. Anytime in the Old, in the Old Testament that you, you hear of a bright light, a burning bush, a bright light, the, the lightning that was on the top of Mount Sinai. Moses, when he came down, his, 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 his face was transformed and it shined brightly because he had been with the Lord. It's the same thing that Peter, John, and James experience when they go to the Mount of Transfiguration and there with Jesus, Jesus is transformed. His inside, his deity is he's expressed through his manity and he who he is, eternal light is bright before them and they bow down and worship. The apostle Paul is encountering Jesus Christ. And what happens when the apostle Paul encounters Jesus Christ? He is convicted. He's convicted. And he fell down to the ground and heard a great voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? A couple things about these scriptures. Number one, we do not come to God on our own. He comes to us. He always initiates first contact. So I'm a big sci-fi fan, mostly because it's totally divorced from reality, right? And every time the humans come in contact with the aliens, the stupid humans bump into the aliens, is because the aliens want them to bump into them. They go and contact the humans because they're the ones that are flying around the universe, have all the advanced technology and stuff, and every now and then they dip down to us just to play with our minds, right? That's the same thing with the Lord, only different. You don't come to God on your own. God opens up your mind to the truth of the gospel, and he intersects your life. He stops you. Something funny happens to you on the way to hell. You get saved. And look what he says. He says he fall, falls to the ground. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You ever stop to think about that? That the person you're talking about that is a believer, the people you're gossiping about, the spouse that you may be hurting, the children that you're not doing right with, the parents that you're not obeying, that you're not doing that to them, that you're doing that to Jesus? Do you think there's ever a person that's abused that Jesus doesn't feel it? Do you think there's ever a person who is murdered that Jesus is not right there? Paul picks up on this and teaches us that Jesus is the head. And later on in his epistles into the Corinthians and to the Ephesians, says, we are the body of Christ. And what we feel, Jesus feels. Jesus knows exactly how you feel right now. He knows exactly what's going on in your life. He knows everything that you're saying about that person that's a part of him. 
That's why you need to take serious what the Bible says in 1 Peter. Hey, you husbands, you need to treat your wives as an equal, as a fellow heir of life. Or I'm not even going to answer your prayers. Why? Because how you treat your husband and how you treat your wife, you're treating Jesus that way. Treating Jesus. That's why you shouldn't gossip about anybody. You're gossiping about the Lord. That's why you should withhold no good thing from people. You're withholding that from the Lord. And so we learn from this that Jesus was suffering with his church and every person that died. And as Stephen was sown and as people went in prison, Jesus is with them. And I'm telling you, Jesus is with you, believer. Whatever is going on in your life, he feels, he knows, he understands that you're scared. He knows that you're afraid. He knows that you're weak, but he wants you to know he is more than able and you're not in heaven with him yet because he's not done with you and he will strengthen you with his grace. And so the apostle Paul falls down on his face, a supernatural light. God is speaking to, to, to Paul. And basically, Paul writes later in Ephesians, he said, when you were dead in your processes and sin in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit is now working in the sons of disobedience. That was me. And God had to stop me. He said, God had to stop this craziness that was in my life. And then not only is contact, but there is conviction. He said, why are you persecuting me? And then there is conversion. In verse number five, he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Remember I told you last week, night before I got saved, I said, Lord, if you're real, you got to show me. You may have prayed something similar to that. Lord, who are you? Who are you, Lord? Paul's overcome. The Lord... Jesus is showing himself to him. In in, in 1 Corinthians 15, God, I saw the Lord like one born out of due season. And and, and he said, I had this life-changing experience when I saw Jesus. Have you seen the Lord? Why are you here today? Let me tell you why you're here today. Because you're on the bad road, a broad road. That's going to lead to destruction. And Paul not only was destroying people, he was destroying himself. Look what he says. It's it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Jesus said, hey, it's me. I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And by the way, it's pretty hard on you right now, isn't it, Paul? You know what a goad is? Long stick with a sharp end on it. You would goad cattle. You would goad an ox because they won't do what you want them to do. And Paul was pushing up against it, and he was kicking up against it. You ever stub your toe at your house? Your little toe? What's your first response? Is it anger? Mine is. And it's anger, and I go, Christy, (laughs) why'd you move the furniture? Furniture's been there 10 years. But I think of blaming somebody else for the self-inflicted damage that I'm doing to myself. And some of you do the same thing spiritually. It's that church's fault. It's that greedy church down there. It's that guy that's on TV. It's the pastor that hurt me. It's my parents that were so strict on me and I'm never going to go back to that church again. And you keep kicking against the truth and your foot's bloody and your conscience is always bothering you and it's seemingly you can't get anywhere with the Lord because you are taking the conviction that he's given you and you're turning it into callousness. It means to inflict pain on yourself by continuing to do what you do by resisting God. You can't fight God. You can't rebel against God. You can't make war against God and not feel the pain. You cannot persecute his church and not feel the pain. You cannot be in bad relationship with good people that love Jesus and not feel the pain. He said, why are you doing this, Paul? And then he understands. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 and 17, thinking about his conversion experience, he says this, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to service. Paul, trustworthy. Paul, who who could care less about Christians and was trying to kill them and persecute them. He said, I was trustworthy, even though I once was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. He said, those things were true of me. 
But I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with all the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. I met Jesus. And what I got from Jesus wasn't what I was given. It was faith. It was mercy. It was love. It was salvation. I was overwhelmed on that road to Damascus. And I fell on my face before God. And he spoke to me. And I obeyed what he said. He said, here's a trustworthy statement. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. He said, God did this as an example to those who believe in him and receive eternal life. You're not as bad as you think you are. You're worse. But that doesn't keep God from loving you. That doesn't stop God from pursuing you. That doesn't stop God in the midst of the insanity of the darkness of your heart and soul to put people in your way, to show you the light, to hear his voice just like you're hearing now so that you could stop and a funny thing can happen to you on the way to hell. You can get saved today. You can give your life to Jesus. Then there was obedience. Acts, verse 9 again, chapter 9, rather, verse 6 to 8. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? There's a sign of somebody whose life's changed. Before that, I don't care what, God doesn't want this thing to happen here. So I'm going to go against everything that God is doing. And now all of a sudden, he's down there on his face before God. He is hearing a voice that nobody else, they heard the sound, but they couldn't distinguish the voice. Let me tell you what preaching and reading the Bible and people witnessing to me before I came to Christ sound like. Wah, 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 wah. Wah, wah, wah. Sound like Charlie Brown's teacher, Right? That's what it sounded like. But all of a sudden, I meet Jesus. Not only my eyes are open, but my ears are open, and I hear what nobody else can hear. That's why my family thought I was crazy. That's why my friends thought I was crazy. That's why people thought, you're just a Jesus freak, or you have gone nuts, or just Jesus Christ is your... No, I heard God speak to me, and I did what any sane person who now sees the light and understands what Jesus did. I say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because this is no longer my life. You tell me what you want me to do. It's a magnificent picture of salvation. It is a miracle. It is sudden. It is explosive. It is the work of God in your life, and your life immediately changes. But then over time, you begin to understand everything that God's done in your life. So what happens to Paul? You read later on here in chapter 9, he preaches for a while, and then you don't hear him, and then he comes back and he's preaching again. This is when scholars believe Paul's testimony, he said in, in Galatians 1, he said, immediately after I got saved, I didn't go confer with flesh and blood. I didn't go talk to the apostles. I went out into the desert, and for three years, he took all of that Old Testament understanding that he had in Scripture, and he began working out in his mind through the power of the Holy Spirit everything that had happened to him, and that gets spelled out for us in all 13 of those books that he wrote in the New Testament. Let me give you a couple of the over 30 things that happen to you instantaneously, whether you feel it or not, when you give your life to Christ. That's why I believe this was so dramatic with Paul. And he saw the light and he was blinded by it and he heard the voice. And now he has gone off into the wilderness and he is listening to the voice of God. He is being built up so that we could have this truth of what happened to him. Over 33 things, the Bible says in the New Testament, happen to you immediately that have nothing to do with what you've done other than the grace of God. You don't earn these things. It's by grace alone. They are instantaneous at the point of salvation. And let me give you 10 of the 30 plus that Paul talks about because we're running out of time. Number one, we're redeemed. The believers purchased out of the slave market of sin. Why did Paul do what he was supposed to do? Because his father was the devil. Just like my father was the devil. And if you don't know Christ, your father's the devil. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees? You are of your father, the devil, because you do his works. I'm not. And so 
Paul was redeemed. He was a slave to sin. He was on the auctioning block. His life wasn't his to do with what he pleased. And now Jesus comes and buys him permanently out of sin, even to the point where his physical body is going to be renewed one day, just like mine and just like yours. We are reconciled with God. Perfect and unending peace with God on the merit of Jesus Christ. My peace is not, my happiness is circumstantial. It is feeling oriented. But my peace with God is uninterrupted and unending because when God sees me, he sees the merit of Jesus Christ in my life and I'm a new creation. I am forgiven and you are forgiven of all your sin. Every trespass, past, present, and the future have been forgiven in Christ. Paul writes in, 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 in Romans 8, he says, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hard stop. Hard stop. You're not condemned. You don't have to worry not whether or not you're going to make it to heaven. Heaven's in you. Christ in you is your hope of glory. And so all of my sin, even the sin that I was going to commit 20 years after I gave my life to Christ, was forgiven. And the sin, if I live to be another 20 years older than I'm going to commit, it is forgiven. It does not stand in my way or in my relationship with God. It doesn't determine how much he loves me because I have been forgiven all of my sin, period. Or sin capacity. What we call our flesh, crucified with Christ. The death of Christ is a judgment on my sin nature. I am delivered from the reigning power of sin. We are placed permanently before God and our sin is totally judged in Christ. He says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but I don't live Christ in me. And the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you want to overcome sin, it has been overcome in Jesus Christ. We're the children of God. Believer becomes an heir of God, born into the family of God. I call and you call the first person of the Trinity, Father. He's my dad. Satan used to be my dad, but he's not my dad anymore. My dad sent Jesus to die on the cross for me so that I wouldn't have to live in darkness anymore and I wouldn't have to be a slave to sin anymore and I wouldn't have to die and be separated from him in hell anymore. A funny thing happened to me on the way way to hell. I got saved. I got saved. Delivered from the power of darkness. We're almost done. Liberated from satanic realm, period. Listen to what he says. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. He said that in 2 Corinthians. Paul said, look, let me tell you why I saw that light. I saw that light because I was in the kingdom of darkness and then I saw the light and Jesus took me out of this darkness and he put me in this light that I'm never going to be darkness again because now I am light in the Lord. There is no demon in hell that has power over me. I am standing in the righteousness of Christ and in the light of the Lord. Circumcised in Christ. That means I'm a brand new person. According to what he says in Ephesians 2, 17 and Colossians 2, 11. You're going to like this one and I promise we're getting close to the end. We are united with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If I know Jesus as my Savior, God is my Father. Jesus is my only, older brother and the Holy Spirit has sealed me for all eternity. I'm born of the Spirit, John 3, 6. I'm baptized by the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I'm indwelt by the Spirit, Romans 5, 5. I'm sealed by the Spirit. I'm filled with the Spirit. I can't go anywhere without the Spirit of God inside of me. I am in God, according to what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 1. The believer is in God. The believer is in the, uh, the Father is in the believer, Ephesians 4, 6. The believer is in the Son, Romans 8, 1. The Son is in the believer, Romans 14, 20. The believer is in the Spirit, Romans 8, 9. And the Spirit is in the believer, 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 12, verse 12. Who else is going to get in you? Where else can you go? 
What more can be done for you? I'm in God. God's in me. Christ is, I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. The Spirit of God is in me and I'm in the Spirit. I'm going to be taken to heaven one day and no weapon formed against me is going to prosper because a funny thing happened to me on the way to hell. I got saved. I got saved. And this one wraps it up. I'm complete in him. I possess every spiritual blessing. Paul writes in Colossians, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him, Jesus, you have been made complete. Whatever you're lacking, you find it in Jesus. Well, well, welcome back. Um, I pray that you heard from the Lord uh, during the message, during worship, during our time of prayer together. Um, And those prayers were answered the things that you were seeking, and maybe you were seeking to really sense his presence, and maybe that's something that you haven't felt um, before, and it happened for you today, where you, right where you are, no matter where you're at, through the worship, through the prayers, through the praise today, you felt God's presence. He is in all places, and he's for you. He's not against you, and maybe your prayers were answered today. If they were, we'd love to hear from you and, and, and what that was and how God delivered on that prayer for you. And maybe it's uh, salvation. Maybe today you were saved uh, through the message and the word today. We want to hear from you on that and, and whatever else that you may need, however else that we can partner with you and minister uh, to you, we want to be able to do that. So there's some contact information uh, below. and. Um, Please take advantage of it. We're standing by to uh, to minister to you and to walk this life out together. Uh, we sure love you and we appreciate you. And we look forward to seeing you again next time.